Okay, so welcome. Here we go. We're going to start with episode number 63. This is the Passy Cemetery in the 16th arrondissement, just next to Trocadero Square and obviously against the backdrop of none other than the Eiffel Tower. I've got a lot of great stuff to show you. Now, this Passy Cemetery, it was opened in 1820. Uh, back then, it was actually outside the city limits of Paris uh, before that very famous 1860 expansion where Paris was enlarged and swallowed up these outer boroughs that used to be the suburbs and many of them very undeveloped and quite rural. So this area was known as Passy, outside of Paris until 1860. And then when that happened, this cemetery got real, real popular. And it's got, it boasts some really, really big names despite its, its very small size. In fact, only about 2,600 tombs, but it's considered to be the Paris cemetery with the highest ratio of notable names per square foot. And I would argue that you come here for the big names, but you stay for the unexpected beauty for sure. So let's get closer. This episode is designed to get you closer to the soul of Paris, and we're going to certainly get closer to some other souls today. This is a, a little known Russian uh, painter and sculptor. Her name was, and I hope I can pronounce this right, uh, Bashkirtsev, Marie Bashkirtsev. She was a, an extremely promising young artist, but stricken by tuberculosis here in Paris at just 25 years old. She died in 1884 just as she was leaving her mark on the Paris art scene and the intellectual scene. The Nazis destroyed many of her paintings eventually during the war, but some of them uh, exist. And I want to show you not only an image of her, but a painting that she's done as well, or that she did do. So let me show you. You know I like to share images, so how about we go with that view. Again, this is Bashkirtsev, 25-year-old Russian painter and sculptor in Paris back in the 19th century. Very promising and so so sad that she was taken away at such a young age, 25. So that's her. Now she's got quite a, a beautiful tomb for having passed away at 25 and let me show you she was a renowned painter and this is one image of hers it was called The Meeting beautifully done and rather indicative of you know a common style in the 19th century very refined and a bit stylized but beautifully beautifully done from a technical standpoint um, so she was most famous for her death uh, or most famous for her journal I should say and let me show you as I tell you about the journal Sorry, I just want to, there we go. What's remarkable is that her tomb is so big because it's a recreation of her studio. And I'm going to do my best here to give you that view. It's a very sunny day, so I'm going to try to cut down the glare. Hope you can make that out. She was most famous for her journal that she wrote. And it talked about her recurring illness of what would become tuberculosis and uh, the journal was considered a, uh, an excellent documentation of life as an artist and an intellectual in the 19th century and it's very well written and she said in her journal she said if I do not die young I hope to live as a great artist but if I die young I intend to have my journal published and when I'm dead my life which appears to me a remarkable one will be read So there's our first lovely tomb of the day. This is a, a gentleman by the, came, by the name of Naramenbakov. I'm probably butchering that, but th this is, it appears to be colored plastic. And uh, again, there's a bit of glare there, but just Lovely. He, he was a painter and he did many paintings similar to this very vibrant, colorful style. So I wanted to point that out. So if you're just joining me, we are in the Passy Cemetery, 16th arrondissement. A very overlooked concentration of notable names, but a lot of just real, real beautiful stuff. I know some of you are like me and you're absolute lovers of a good cemetery. Let me show you this here. 
This is cute, but it's also sad. There's a full-size bronze dog, if I can get my big fat shadow out of the way. Lovely. What's a bit sad though, is it definitely looks like a dog that's waiting for its master to come home. So it's a bit of a lonely dog, a melancholy dog, but it's just a beautiful, beautiful detail. And then of course the French are known for doing mausoleum style tombs and crypts that descend a bit further underground. And I hope to give you a bit of a feel for that, like this, for example. We can't enter there, but this beautiful staircase descends down into that section. And there, we're looking back at the tomb of Bashkirtsev. Stained glass is stunning. This tomb here is a little beat up, but the door's open, so if I can allow myself just to pop the camera in enough for you to enjoy that. Gonna get a good shoulder workout today. And a couple of tombs down, some more brilliant glass. Look at this. I actually love the ironwork at the gate here as well, composition st style. Good morning and bonjour everybody. Don't think that I'm uh, avoiding you or ignoring you. It's great to see all of those well wishes and the hellos coming in. We're at the Passy Cemetery in the 16th arrondissement with lots of treasures and as I pan around here, speaking of treasures, look at this beauty. Now it's been covered up because uh, perhaps it was deemed a bit too fragile. But in fact, what it is, is it's a copy of Michelangelo's famous Pieta statue that's in the Vatican. If you've been through there and you've been able, you've been fortunate enough to see uh, Michelangelo's Pieta, it's pretty, pretty fantastic to say the least. And I want to show you, for those who need a refresher, I want to show you the original version. Of course, a Pieta is a typical theme of statuary that represents Mary and Christ. And if I can allow myself just to enjoy a composition here, a reminder that the Eiffel Tower is almost always looming in the distance in a very lovely way at the Passy Cemetery. This is a gentleman by the name of, not a big name in history, I believe you would call him Pereni? I don't know, someone in a YouTube comment recently said, I can't believe you've been there all this time and your pronunciation is still so bad. So sorry to that person, I'm doing my best even with my French wife, who is more than happy to correct me. Uh, all kinds of pitfalls and traps when you're trying to pronounce this stuff, especially live on camera. I love this shot here. Let me get the shadow in frame two. So one of the biggest names of this cemetery is this gentleman here. We've got a, a bus that's quite dark, but it's Mr. Manet. Famous painter from the Impressionist era. It's about as light as I can get that for you. Oh, no, actually, I'm lying because guess what I brought today just for... Uh, hold on. It's somewhere in one of these pockets. Just for these sorts of occasions and peeking into the tombs. A light. So hopefully that helps you get a look at Manet and his significant beard. <laughs> uh, it's not a 
flashy to me. But uh, let's meditate on Manet for a second. He was a good friend of the Impressionists, although he never exactly considered himself one. He never quite identified with that style like the others, but he was part of that crew. And this is called, this is the famous Déjeuner sur l'herbe, the lunch on the grass or the luncheon on the grass. This was really one of the standout uh, paintings that put Manet on the map, partly because it was so, I gotta get out of people's way, we're not the only ones admiring this tomb. Partly because it was so controversial, you know, not least of which for the fact that it was a nude woman next to some clothed men. But look at that composition, and I want to point out a fun fact, because I like a good art historical fun fact. Manet did not invent this composition. He was heavily inspired by someone else. Let me show you a comparison. Uh, he, would, so he was a lover of the old masters. He would go to the, the Louvre, and he would sit down, and he would copy the, the masters of the Italian Renaissance. That's how we met Monet, actually. They were both copying a, uh, a painting in there. It was a Velasquez, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a Raphael image from way back in the 16th century. And hopefully you can make that out. Manet is intentionally drawing direct inspiration from this engraving of a Raphael composition. I find that to be quite, quite interesting. Ah, Terry McGilvray says, love the in-depth research you do. I appreciate that. Uh, that was called the Judgment of Paris, by the way, interestingly, that Raphael image that Manet used. So maybe because there was a that Paris link, maybe that prompted Manet to, to use it for his very famous and controversial painting. But if we pan down here, of course, we have writing that says Manet and his wife, but his brother's here also, Eugene. Because Manet, Manet was Edward, Edouard, and this is Eugène, or Eugene, and his brother married, no slouch herself, Berthe Morisot. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she was an incredible impressionist in her own right. And um, I'm going to show you an image of hers. She actually painted Manet's brother, Eugene, who was her husband, of course. And I want to show you that because Morisot sometimes doesn't get quite as much credit as she deserves, overshadowed by some of those other guys. So this is her husband. This is by Morisot. And it's her husband, brother of Manet. And she was a powerhouse. Took her a while to get her due. But isn't that fantastic that you've got Manet and his sister-in-law both buried here and both uh, exceptional painters. And I just realized I printed out another, another image that I don't want to waste. These are two of Manet's, Edward Manet's uh, beautiful masterpieces, a couple of my favorites. It's called The Railway and then A Bar at the Folie Bergère. I know many of you are lovers of those paintings as well, so thank you, Mr. Manet. You deserve... Frankly, you deserve a fancier tomb than this, but you've got a great spot. Onward. It's a nice visual. Sometimes it's about the history, sometimes I just want to share a visual with you, this blessed virgin with a sort of trellis, of course acting as a halo behind her head as well. I know it's backlit, but hopefully, hopefully that composition is doing you right. How about this for fun? I love this. Because even when someone famous isn't buried in the cemetery, sometimes they can still be here. This gentleman is not really remembered by history all that much, Bouteillet. But this medallion, which is a beautiful 3D representation of Bouteillet's face, was done by none other than Rodin, Auguste Rodin. And if I might zoom in a little bit, I hope that you can make out right here, if it's not too dark, the name Rodin. I admit I don't yet know exactly what the relationship was between these two men, because I'm sure you got to do something right to get Rodin to, to sculpt your medallion. But isn't that a lovely view? So well done to Rodin, and I love that he, that amazing sculptor, has little bits and pieces all throughout Paris hidden in plain sight. This is nice too. It's 
composition with a few elements. <laughs> Sue Ann Hum says, Rodin, cool. That could be a t-shirt, Sue Ann. Just Rodin with a, an exclamation mark and then cool. Check in on the Eiffel Tower, yeah, it's still there. Look at this beauty. Uh, I'm gonna start from the bottom. I'll show you what's inside in a minute. The Ferret family, don't know too much about them. But I knew they, I do know they killed it with their tomb design, no pun intended. The doors are dynamite too. Hey Phyllis, I see you there. She's saying I love to see the Lady Eiffel. So thank you, Ferre family, for allowing us to enjoy this moment. You look like you were a lovely couple. Let us pop through here. Oh yeah, I want to show you this. There's so much I want to show you. I'm probably going to run long on this episode, as usual. I like that gothic little mausoleum just chilling out. So, you know, surviving family members will have keys to these mausoleum doors. And there are, of course, small altars, altar pieces, photos, statuary. Great lion vibe here. Okay, I gotta make my way through this little maze here. Okay, this next tomb, I'll show you how I first discovered it. I was looking just inside this little mausoleum here, and then the, the stained glass had been blown out, and then I found that. It's a little glimpse of some gargoyles, if you can make that out. So I want to show you. It's just fun to see it through the window first. And then come around. This one's a, quite a view. just brown color that you don't often see. It reminds me of the cathedral at uh, Strasbourg in Alsace. And yes, complete with its gargoyles up top, if you can make those out. Hey, Hassan Manning's in the house, fantastic. Can't wait to see you here in Paris, buddy. A little bit of stained glass in there. This is probably what I would want my tomb to look like. The problem is if I remain married to my wife for the rest of my life, she will never ever agree to this style. This is, you know, the 1800s, mid late 1800s. There was still such a neo Gothic fervor. Everybody really was was a fan. There was a resurgence in the medieval style, and so no surprise there that that family chose Gothic. But yeah, I don't think my wife Charlotte's gonna go for that. Uh, here, just a n lovely door, worth a look. Very ornate wreaths. And then, oops, sorry, for the camera work.
Sue Ann, one of our resident artists, just said, okay, I will be sketching here in May when I come. Some, some more dorage. Can we uh, instate that as a vocab word here, dorage? Dina's asking if that was a crown of thorns. I guess it could have been Dina. Well done. Okay. So we come around. I still got plenty of great stuff to show you. I'm so glad it's a beautiful sunny autumn day because this perspective in particular with those, look at the colors of that. The glass and the trees. Oh. Hassan Manning says, hashtag Dorage, done. Thanks, buddy. Once it becomes a hashtag, it's legit. So look at those colors. I mean, tell me you can't just meditate there for an hour or two. I'm going to tell you about this tomb because there's, there's some beautiful mosaics inside this very tomb. But first, how about a little bit of mystery, so to speak? I guess every, every cemetery should have some. Do you see this white sort of lion, lion creature silhouette, as it were? Well, that's what I thought it was. I thought it was some sort of lion image. But if you zoom in, and I hope I can get close enough, it's just a, a relief of a, of a guy. But however the rain or what or whatnot has watched just a certain part of his face that, for my money, once you back up, it absolutely looks like some kind of creature. Look at that. It's crazy what nature can do. I even asked myself if someone had done that intentionally. But I think it's literally just the way that the rain hits his face. So this is kind of spooky, but it's kind of great, right? Uh, okay, let me show you this. This is a gentleman called Mar Marinoni. Marinoni, and I want to try to find the best spot to show you what's inside. So Marinoni, uh, apparently in, he claimed to have invented the, the rolling press, you know, when you put the, the prints rolled onto a cylinder. Yeah, it was called technically the rotary printing press. But then there was a patent dispute, and uh, apparently it was proven that someone else technically had the idea first. But this guy uh, got credit for being at least part of those the invention, there were early days of the rotary cylindrical printing press, and he's got a stunning tomb. I'm sorry it was so complicated to show you the interior there. I'll just edit that out on the, uh, on the YouTube version. <laughs> okay, so from here, how about a nice slow pan? We've got, like a lot of French cemeteries, a little square here, um, an open space with all the tombs around. And you can see... Uh, Eiffel Tower. Just perfect weather for something like this. Absolutely perfect. Okay, let me show you this. I'm going to set you down again. We're going to walk down there in a minute. But I've got to show you something here. I made an extra effort today because someone gave me a fantastic gift uh, on one of my tours. My name is French Fry in Paris and my patrons uh, call themselves the Frites. And I wanna show you something that um, Lise Kamenyeki and Susan Carter offered me. So can you make this out? Let me try to. They bought me socks with Frites, with little, can make that out. They're French, French, legit French fries, French frites, with the uh, beret and the mustache. So I am definitely representing when it comes to our community known as the frites. If you want to become a frite, you can uh, sign up on my Patreon page and help support this project and help it to continue and improve along the way. 
and you can do that via the link in the description here of this of this video so not only do I want to do that but I want to switch lenses so thank you to Lise Kam Kamenyeki if I'm pronouncing your name right and Susan Carter Suki as she's known uh, let me set this down zoom lens Ooh, someone just said I had great ankles. I'll take it. <laughs> Roma Supera says, Corey, you need to wear shorts with those socks. I don't know, Roma, if I'm quite there yet. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's like a statement statement. I think I'd rather conceal them for the right moment. That's more my style. Yeah, Sandra Duran, Duran says, so peaceful, absolutely. Mostly chestnut trees, by the way, that we're surrounded by here. I don't often know what's going on with the tree situation, but I did find that out. Uh, right here, we're not gonna walk over there, but have you heard of the, muse the Cognac J Museum? The Musée Cognac J? It's near the, it's in the Marais, near the Place des Vosges, and that's the name, Cognac and J are, are the names of two, uh, a power couple. They founded the Samaritan department store, which is being redone right now near the Pont Neuf, and they were big art collectors, and so they bequeathed their art collection to the state and opened up, a, allowed a museum to be made. So check out the Musée Cognac J. That's where the two of them, man and wife, are, are buried there in that tomb. And you can see Rembrandt and Cezanne and Degas and a whole wide range of, of artists. Look at this. Obviously, this place is really really quiet because even despite being so close to Chocadero very few people find the, the entrance this is I don't know who this person is but I noticed this and it's lovely here I'm going to do my best to give you a sort of a gorilla translation it says my ears no longer hear anything and I no longer have any eyes as the call from above comes to awaken my heart my lamp is lighted because there's no longer any wind I think that's quite nice. Um, oh, there's a door here that I don't want to overlook. A lot of religious iconography. We've got the, I don't know the official name, but where they, they burn the incense, right? And they swing the those inc incense lanterns, so to speak, around, and we've got the bishop's hat and whatnot. Lovely. So just to change things up, why don't we look at the tomb of someone's name that I'm probably going to mispronounce. Uh, Bao Dai was the last emperor of Vietnam. Look at that, and I'll give you the composition because the tower, the tower is there. Uh, so this emperor, Bao Dai, was deposed in 1955, spent the rest of his life in France. The French wanted to colonize India back in the day, but there was so much British expansion that it stagnated the French progress. So France moved toward uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, became known as French Indochina. Lasted around 60 years or so, the French colonization of Vietnam. And at first, when I moved here, I found that a lot of my friends, my French friends and my wife's family and whatnot, they were going on vacation to Vietnam, Vietnam, and I, was, I thought, why are the French so obsessed with Vietnam? And then it dawned on me, I realized. Dorage. Still got some fantastic stuff to show you, including in the tour extension today. If you want to support this and become part of our team of patrons in our lovely community, private community, then you're going to enjoy extensions of these video tours 
and I'll be doing one today for the frites. And you get all sorts of other rewards too, not just the tour extensions. I do my best to take care of those supporting this project. Look at this guy. May not recognize the name, Kost or Kostas, depending. Uh, this guy, he and his co-pilot, who happens to also be buried here at the Passy Cemetery, completed the first non-stop flight from Paris to New York. It was 1930, and it was a huge undertaking. And let me zoom in here. Lovely. I mean, cemeteries are just great for this kind of thing, unexpected uh, visuals. And so this is great. This is an actual constructed object with some of his famous flight paths. And so this 1930, he and his co-pilot, first ones to ever do a non-stop direct flight from Paris to New York. Nowadays, that flight will take you seven or eight hours on average. Back then, it took them 37 hours and 14 minutes. 37 hours just flying with your co-pilot across the Atlantic. Just stunning. So well done to him. By the way, if you go back to my uh, episode that was called Lesser Known Trocadero, we saw a building together and I saw two aviators, their heads sculpted on a facade. And I asked myself, who are these aviators? I can't find any reference to them. And I don't know for sure, but hey, it's a theory. I'm going to throw it out there that maybe it was these two gentlemen who are buried in the same neighborhood. Maybe that's who we saw in that building. You never know, there are always new links to be made and new connections to be forged as you learn more and more about these areas. I'm gonna show you Debussy because Debussy is a, another big name uh, composer who happens to be here, but it's quite lovely there, isn't it? We've got, I believe, the Blessed Virgin, Virgin coming to the door of the grave with some flowers. And we've got a bit of fall foliage here, and it's just pretty dynamite. Why don't I switch one last time to the wide-angle lens? Because I'm going to show you WC, and then I'm going to show you something absolutely dynamite that I'm just so excited to share with you. WC is actually, despite being such a big name here, uh, very hard to find. It took me two or three passes my first time here because he's tucked away. He's not on the main drag. And it's absolutely a, an understated tomb. There we go. WC was a French composer. <clears throat> when he was young, he grew up um, just outside the city in the Burbs, and then he moved into Paris eventually. Received an early music education at the Paris Conservatory. Interestingly similar to Manet, you know, sometimes people would refer to him as a, an impressionist composer, but he never really accepted that term. He died in 1918 when Paris was still in the throes of World War I and they were being bombarded by the Germans. So um, he would have had, because he was a big name, he would have had a proper ceremonial burial with all the fanfare and the respect, but they couldn't do that because of German bombing. So they actually popped him into Père Lachaise temporarily. Uh, and then he was transferred over here. His final sort of dying wish was, was be, uh, to be buried among the trees and the birds. And that's certainly the case now. Just to give you a reminder that even artistic geniuses get caught up in life's little dramas, or in this case, big dramas. He was married, if you see, but then he fell in love with a mistress a mistress by the name of Bard Bardac, Emma Bardac. She happened to be a mistress of another famous French composer, Fauré, who's buried here. I'm going to show the Fritz that during our tour extension. And um, so he's got this side action with Bardac, and he tells his wife, I want a divorce. And she freaks out, and she goes to Place de la Concorde here in Paris, takes out a, a gun and tries to shoot herself in the chest and commit suicide out in the middle of, uh, of, the, of the street, in the middle of town. And the bullet lodges in her vertebrae, but it does not kill her. And then um, uh, Debussy goes on to marry Baldac, his mistress. So there you go. One last thing. That I think you'll appreciate. And then we'll, we'll, I'll sign off, at least for the public version, and we'll switch to the private tour extension of 
Passy Cemetery. So this one right here, it's pretty imposing in its own right, right? It's big. Not a famous family, as far as I know. It's all mosaic. And there are two little staircases that lead down here. Right? Wow, look at that. Eleanor Marsh says, I saved the best for last. I Absolutely did, Eleanor. Let me show you the ceiling. So this is just quietly hiding out in the Passy Cemetery in the 16th Avonismo. Uh, almost nobody knows about it, and it's such an easy tomb to pass by. Okay, I'm going to finish out the episode here. And the next thing I'm going to do might ruffle a few feathers. It might rub some of you the wrong way. And I apologize in advance, but I really am dedicated to getting us closer to the soul of Paris. So I'm not recommending you do this, but I am just going to take us down here respectfully. respect for this fine family we're going to admire the beauty of their crypt here this is where I get to feel a bit like a sort of an urban Indiana Jones episode. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. If you want to follow me on Instagram or my blog or take a tour with me in Paris, I do that full-time here, a full-time tour guide. You can come see me in person and we can tour this lovely city together. You can support this project by signing up on my Patreon page. That link is in the description as well. And if you are already a patron, one of your rewards, of course, pop over to our private Facebook group known as the Cafe Chats group. And we're going to continue this beautiful historical tour through the Passy Cemetery. You can catch the HD replay on my YouTube channel in the next day or two, and I'll let you all know about that. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you for the next episode. If you can't bring yourself to Paris, I'm going to keep bringing Paris to you. Take care. Bye.